Okay, so uh, this week we've been learning a little bit about web technology. Uh, tomorrow on Blackboard I should have your web tech assignment, which will be due next Thursday. It's similar to the uh, history assignment, where it'll be done through the assessments of Blackboard. So it'll be automatically graded for you. It'll be a couple of multiple choice completion and maybe some matching. Uh, there is a website called the evolutionofweb.app.com. And what that'll do, and in order for you guys to fully use this website the way it's intended to be used, is you must have a modern day web browser. That is a web browser that can handle HTML5. And uh, it's a really cool uh, sort of website, it just came out a couple of months ago, that's illustrating all the different technologies that have come to pass and even still present in web browsers to make modern day web technology possible. Okay? So, uh, do check on that. Like I said, it's due next Thursday. Uh, for the next couple of weeks or so, we're going to be exploring uh, web technologies, databases, as well as um, the internet. Uh, one of the activities I have for today is actually how to take Excel and integrate it with the World Wide Web so that our spreadsheets are constantly filled with up-to-date information. So we're going to be covering two things at once. All right, and you'll be seeing me do this more often in class. I'll be using some of the actual Office programs to tie in the theory. Uh, this is the last Excel for this week. It's been posted on Blackboard. It is due uh, Tuesday. Now, you guys are asking why are sometimes it's due on Monday and sometimes it's due on Tuesday. Uh, I posted this yesterday. So I'd like to give you guys a week. So the end of the academic week would be Tuesday. But if I post it like on Tuesday, then the end of that week will be on Monday. Okay? Where do you find out this? Go to Blackboard, go to My IT Lab. Both of them have calendars or task lists. They'll tell you when the assignments are due. Pay attention, log on on a daily basis to see any of these things. All right? I'll do my best to try to remind you in class. But this week is the last week of Excel. Next week we'll be moving to Access. And right around that time, I'll be covering database theory and how we use this in web technology. So the question is, what is web technology? When we met on Tuesday, I was just getting into the cornerstones of what made the web possible. In fact, we were getting into the difference between the Internet and the World Wide Web. I told you that the Internet was developed in the late 60s for a missile defense program, and it was a Cold War product. When the Berlin Wall came down, it sort of signified the end of the Cold War, and so then we released the internet to the public. See, prior to then, it wasn't considered the internet. It was considered like advanced research project. Um, when we released it to the public, we had all this knowledge, all this resource scattered it wasn't connected or correlated or organized in a manner that would make it more user-friendly. So a gentleman by the name of Tim Berners-Lee developed the web. One of the biggest things that he helped to contribute is this protocol called HTTP. Now remember, protocol is a set of rules that we follow or govern how data is going to be communicated. Now, protocol is just a set of rules, period. So HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. It's basically going to tell all the internet devices how they are going to transfer web pages. Now, I hate to use the, web, I hate to use the word web pages because to me that's just an association like a magazine. Can anybody tell me the difference between a magazine and a newspaper? Or even a textbook at that matter. They're all published resources, correct? But sometimes we associate a magazine to be like a monthly thing, where a newspaper could be a daily thing, and maybe a book is a yearly thing through their editions. So I'm going to try to reframe myself from saying a web page as much as a resource. Because the World Wide Web has evolved to offer more than just web pages. But the heart of the web is actually HTML, which is this hypertext markup language. Remember, Tim Berners-Lee developed three key components to deliver web technology. And the idea behind this was for the web to overlay 
on top of the internet. Translation to give you more of a graphical user interface. Example of that would be his third development. The hyperlink. So we take our cursor, we hover over some special text or an image. We click on it and we expect this ability that when we click on it to transport us to some other place. And that's what this whole hyper thing is. That within a click, we're instantly transferred from place to place, from resource to resource. How do the three of these work together to provide us with our resources? That's yet to be determined. We'll explain, I'm oh, sorry, we'll explore that in a second. But this is just the rules to tell the internet, if you will, how to transfer HTML files, which we call web pages. What makes HTML so magical? It's very simple. It's not even a programming language. We call it a markup language. With that being said, we use special tags that we throw into a text file that tells a web browser how to manipulate or present the text. Bless you. In fact, you can think of like a web browser as a compiler for programmers. The web browser grabs the web pages and starts at the very top of the web page and it's looking for a special tag. All web pages will begin with this tag. I guess you can say that's like a file extension. Web pages can have any kind of different extensions, whether it's .html, which is what's preferred, or .php, or .asp. When a web browser opens up this web resource, this first tag is ultimately going to determine how the web browser is going to display the contents of the file. And of course, there's going to be all this stuff in the middle, and then it's going to end with this tag. And this is what makes HTML fun and easy to learn. A tag is anything that begins with the less than and greater than symbol. Okay. It's used for the web browser to determine what is text and what is commands to tell to do with the text. Most tags begin with the starting tag, have a complementary or a complement tag that has a forward slash in it. So in other words, start, end. Anything that, ends, that it appears in between these tags represents a web page. Okay. There are other components that we'll get into later. But the point that I'm trying to drive out to you is that HTML is a markup language. Remember, there was millions of files already on the internet by the time the World Wide Web became available to you. We had to convince all these doctors, scientists, professors, government agents to take their resources they just got done publishing 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and add a few of these tags so they become compliant with a web browser. Now what's remarkable about HTML is it's been around since the 90s. The same web pages that were created back in the 90s still function today. It's getting harder to say that about Microsoft Office files. In the last few years or so, haven't we made a transition from DOC to DOCX? Can anybody tell me what that X stands for? What's that? No, no, no. Actually, it's like a cousin to HTML. It stands for XML. And the X stands for Extension Markup Language. See, so when we discovered something, we realized that if we can make this migration from Office to the web, 
and then any files that somebody creates in Microsoft Office or anything else that supports XML can be read naturally through a web browser. See, XML gave programmers or web developers a way to create a scheme for data. So for instance, maybe a Word document will start off with this tag and maybe it'll end with this tag. And what makes up a Word document? Maybe paragraphs, right? Because after all, isn't a Word document just a glorified text editor? So our whole idea about XML and converting to this new file format was to make it more transparent to the technologies that make the web possible. So that when you guys submit a file, like a DOCX file, to your email, and if your email is using like, sorry, if your email is Gmail or some other modern day email, instead of downloading it, you can click open and it'll open up a web app to allow you to print, edit, save, or even share with other users across the World Wide Web. Have you guys used this with your Gmail? Your school accounts are Gmail accounts. Have you had somebody send you a Word document, bless you, in which instead of clicking the download button, you can click open and Google Docs will open up. What is the big advantage about this? Because the person who developed that Word document had no clue about web technology. They just sent it to you as an email. Your email program was smart enough. So it's more, uh, what do we call that, efficient? because you're not downloading, making multiple copies, this is one copy that exists on a server. Many people can share that copy, so you get this online collaboration. Make changes, everybody else sees it. We'll be exploring this technique, sorry, this technology next week. What else though? To me, it's the biggest advantage. You don't have to buy any software and have it downloaded on your computer. More importantly, it works on your iPad, your smartphone, because all of those devices are web compliant. So you see this transition that we're making more and more towards the web? And I just mentioned another key term here, web apps. Welcome to web 2.0. What's the difference between a web app and a desktop application? Google Docs is an example of a web app. Well, it doesn't exist locally. You don't download it, you don't install it. It exists via this cloud. What is this cloud that we've been talking about or referencing? And why do we call it a cloud? Because clouds are everywhere, right? When you look up in the sky, no matter where you're at in the world, there's going to be some form of sorry, precipitation, which we call clouds. Seems like everywhere we go in the world, we have an internet connection. And in this cloud, we're going to have web technologies. What makes these web technologies possible? Servers connected together to other servers that meet the users some way. What kind of servers will they be? One's going to be a web server. And by the way, I'm not saying that there's only one web server out there in the world. Yeah, the and only web server. No, there's millions of web servers out there. Another might be a domain name server. Another might be an email. Another might be a database server. Another one might be for dynamic content. Like an ASP server or a PHP. Now, could these servers services be running on the same server? Absolutely. Notice I call them services now. 
So let's go back a second so we can spring forward into this cloud. It all stems from these three concepts that make the web possible. In order to access these resources, we need a web browser. The web browser ultimately determines how the user will interact with these services. Earlier I said in order to be able to do that homework assignment that's due next Thursday, you need an HTML5 compliant web browser. Today, that's just me saying download the latest IE, Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, and you'll be fine. But how do we know what technologies our web browser can handle? There's your homework assignment. In your homework assignment, it's going to be a timeline. It's going to have the date of like 1992. What does 1992 represent? First time Mosaic was offered to the world. What was Mosaic? The first web browser, right? And it's going to go all the way up to today. Underneath this timeline, there's going to be about four or five web browsers. And they're all going to have their own little lines, if you will, coming out from them. It's going to be Mosaic, Netscape, Internet Explorer, uh, Safari, Chrome, and Firefox, if I remember correctly. And then through those timelines, there's going to be little milestones that are going to be marked up through there. And then you're going to see all these pretty colors flowing all over the place. Each color will represent a piece of technology. One of them is going to be CSS. Another, obviously, is going to be HTML. And you guys should expect HTML to be the very first piece of technology. So you're going to see this coming up across the top. And it's going to say HTML, CSS, it might even say JS. Eventually, you'll see XML. You might even see Flash. And the list goes on and on and on. These are the web technologies that I want to talk about. We already got through HTML, and we'll actually be creating our own web pages using HTML. Latest version is 5. Version 5 is pretty exciting. You'll see when you start interacting with this website how exciting it is. It's non-flash based. Now for you guys, and this should happen, from the user, you guys are used to dealing with flash sites. Flash are pretty cool sites. They have a lot of animation, which you wouldn't have gotten before. Because under the original HTML, it was pretty static driven. Or stagnant. What do I mean by static driven or static content? Stays the same like your address for your house or your phone number, it's most likely static content because it doesn't change as often, correct? So what's the opposite of static content? Can you guys give me an example of a site that would not be able to be around today or exist today if it wasn't for dynamic technologies? YouTube, what else? Facebook. Think about it. See, in static content, the web designer would develop this web page. Nothing would, deal, nothing would change. There would be no variables. There would be no programming. It would be no different than you guys writing a paper. And that would be it. You post it on the web. In order to change it, that person would have to rip that file off the web, modify it, and re-upload it to the server. Okay. When you guys want to update your Facebook status, do you have to call the Facebook developers or designers? No. promise you there's going to be some kind of text box that when you click on there, you can type in whatever you want to type in there. No matter the way it looks, it's, the next of that box is going to be a submit or OK or whatever or add. What does that do? It allows you as the user, using this dynamic technology, whether it's JavaScript or PHP or whatever, to submit the content to their database. Now with modern technologies, this web page now is told, don't fetch it from a web from a text file, but grab it from the database and display it. Hmm, interesting. So we have this foundation, and this is where I last left off with, 
called a web page to give us our structure. That's all it is. Nothing more. And then we add another layer to it. Call it the content. That could be static or dynamic. We love dynamic content, which makes us go back and checks our email every day or checks our Facebook status or our wall. Because with the dynamic content, we're giving you, the user, to basically change directions accordingly. We can customize our websites by having the user authenticate, identify themselves, sign in, and then say, oh, only display this information. We do it on the fly. In order to do that, this content, more likely than not, is stored in a database. How does Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, list goes on and on, even Google, make their money? It's only a fraction of it. Their advertisements couldn't even pay for their cost of upkeep, just to give you guys an idea. I mean, when somebody clicks on a link that I might post, I get one hundredth of a penny. I'm not retiring anytime soon. A hundredth of a penny, folks. That means I need a hundred clicks just to make a penny. Now, granted, I'm sure Facebook gets more than a hundred clicks a second, but nevertheless, where are they getting their money? I don't know, MySpace, Facebook, one of the same. It's like Ford trying to put a patent on the gas pedal. You guys are business people. You're faced with this dilemma. You got this technology. You want to still make it free for your users. But hey, you want to also buy a yacht. How are you going to be able to do that? We are in the information era. Let's talk about television. What's the biggest drawback to TV? And don't even throw modern technology. Let's go back 20 years, 30 years. Remember what I was telling you at the end of class. Content is what drives the world, if you will. Let's look at television. Would you guys buy HBO? If money wasn't an object, would you buy HBO? Would you have a subscription to HBO? Why would you might subscribe to HBO? Because what is it, $20 extra a month or something like that? What do they offer you as a consumer to justify the additional costs when you could just put a pair of bunny ears on the back of your TV and get PBS? Their own original content? Give me an example of some of their original content that might drive you guys to go get HBO. Game of Thrones. What else? Is that it? Because I couldn't justify $20 a month for a show that's only on for two months. Boxing, okay, maybe if you're into that, but what else? Commercial free movies, unadulterated, you know, it's, they're not going to censor any of this. Maybe that's worth it. Depends on your preference. But you guys getting the point though. They understand that their content is what drives their customers to them. Now, let's talk about how Fox, ABC, and NBC make their money. Because those are completely free. Should Fox, ABC, and NBC try to compete on a level like HBO? Can they? Well, their hands are tied behind their back because of some censorship, correct? But still, if you had Game of Thrones on at 8 o'clock on a Monday, and you also had another show on, like the following, on 8 o'clock on a Monday on Fox, now I know with modern technology you can watch both of them, but let's just talk about 30 years ago. If you had to compete, you had to make a choice, which one would you watch? Possibly, but if the show is that good and you're that into it, like American Idol, does it matter about the ads? You're going to watch it, and Fox knows that. And that's why they charge an arm and a leg 
for their ads to be aired during that time frame. How much do we pay for a Super Bowl ad? That's 30 seconds. Millions. And this is why Fox, ABC, and CBS compete to have the rights to air the Super Bowl. What does it all do? It's the content that drives us. Folks, Facebook loves that you guys love using it. You put that content in their database all the time. And guess what? There is no delete button on the internet. And you can even ask Facebook to remove it from their page. I know they've been changing their agreements with you guys, but they'll take it off the page, but they will not delete it out of their database. Why not? That's where they make their money. They can sell it to corporations that are trying to collect data to process it into information. If you are a business person, what could you do with Facebook data? And what are you guys going to do with it? You're my business people. You might know when to advertise, what to advertise, and on what, on what channel or what station or what movie or whatever, because isn't that what you guys are always liking on this stuff? I like this product. I love that movie. Go see this stuff. What else does it do for business people when they use Facebook? Could you not make a product page for Facebook and get feedback instantaneously from your users? All of this is stored in our database. Next week we'll get into database technology, probably towards the tail end of it. But regardless, these databases are shared on the cloud. And hence the keyword is shared on the cloud. And Facebook isn't the only culprit. Google gets in trouble almost every year about privacy rights. What does Google sell to corporations? You guys can even find out what's trending. You're bored, you know you have to do something on the internet, so you go to Google and you try to find out what are the top uh, searches. Now as a business person, especially as a web designer, I want to know the way people behave when they use a search engine. Are they willing to go to page 999 to click on the last link to get to my web page? Are you guys willing? No. How far are you guys willing to go? Four or five links or four or five pages? <laughs> this is a society of tension deficit disorders. So if it's not the first five, forget about it, right? It depends exactly right. Doesn't it all depend on the content of what you're looking for? If you know it's one of those rare things and it's not very popular, but you're passionate about it, you might go to page 999. No? <laughs> Somebody's got ADD issues? <laughs> all right, now, we are aware that everything and anything is being stored on databases. This technology is very beneficial, but it can also bite us in the ass. I feel sorry for your generation when they go to run for uh, political office. I mean, I, I'm thinking how much money was spent in the past to dig out somebody's skeleton in the closet. I mean, the information back then, for them to find it, they have to go through archives of microfilms to get a newspaper clipping from when this person went to college and they smoked pot. Now it's just a matter of going onto YouTube, typing a person's name, and they might be doing a keg stand, and it took them two seconds to get this, and now they're going to use this as dirt to smear the other uh, opponent. Right? Translation, think about everything you do, folks, because people are watching. It's out there. Whether it's closed-circuit TV or not, almost every device has a camera on it. And it's going to be stored in these databases. These databases are connected to servers. On top of this layer, we're also going to have technology for style. Let's say you find something that you're into. If it looked like a command line interface and it was just purely text driven, would you be more prone to share that website to a friend? 
Just the other day when we went to our faculty assembly, I was like, hey, you got to check this website out, the website that I'm going to give you guys for your assignment. Uh, a fellow colleague of mine is a web uh, programmer, developer, and teaches our web courses. And I said, you're going to love this site. And he's like, well, what's it about? And I go, well, they're using HTML5, which is very dynamic, very interactive, to show web history. That's what made me tell him about the site. One, it looked very professional. Two, the information was accurate. But three, it was interactive. It was something new. It hasn't been done before. Isn't that what we're looking for? We're constantly looking at web pages that are pushing the envelope. I remember I was excited when spell checking came to emails. Because what I had to do was type in my email through a word processor like Microsoft Word, get it all spelled correctly, and I'm waiting for grammar checking to come through, but, you know, they're too busy making things look too pretty. But I type in Word, process, uh, Word do all the checking for me, then copy it and paste it into my email. Send it. Today, this technology is implemented by CSS, which stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And it's really cool because, it, like I'm showing you, they're layers upon layers. The content doesn't change. The structure might not change, but the look and feel could change without affecting the server. So I can make updates to things. As business people, how often should a company update their web page, change its look and feel? And you don't want to do it too often, because it's like changing from Windows XP to Windows 7, Windows 8 every two days. The interface change, you're going to scare your clientele away. So you want to try to keep the same navigation. But as far as appearance is concerned, the look of the site, that's what we're dealing with right here. How often should that be? How, how often, sorry? Every six months, maybe every holiday. Valentine's Day is coming back, St. Patrick's Day is this weekend, right? Yeah. And isn't that what stores do? So whatever you do in a brick and mortar store should be no different than what you do for your web presence. How often do you guys change your Facebook profile, your picture there? What's that? Whenever you feel like it. What it have an impact on your friends if you changed it, like business changed their websites every season, every six months? What do you guys think? Yeah, there, is. there are some people that change their relationship status too every day. So sometimes when you change your picture, a lot of people comment like, "Oh, that picture." So when you're having a really bad day, you need to pick yourself up, change your picture, because maybe some people say, "I love your photo. That was very nice," or something like that. Personal, professional, they all vary. Technology is still the same. So styles uh, are a way for designers to implement things on the fly, if you will, without impacting this. It's a big deal because back in the day, it wasn't very friendly. In fact, web pages can be viewed on any device, it seems like. And any device could have different sizes, whether it's your television, your monitor, your laptop, your smartphone. So we got to get our web pages to be very friendly in that. In fact, when somebody arrives through my web page with a smartphone, I want my styling layer to maybe orient that so the buttons are a lot bigger. Right? Because if it's a smartphone, it's a small screen and you're going to have big fingers. I don't want them to change the content, but I want the content to be sort of dynamic and behave differently. Behave according Behavior, I think that's the way you spell that. So that when you come in via a smartphone, maybe we'll rearrange some of the navigation features. Maybe we will block the content that your smartphone doesn't support and maybe give you an alternative that it does. And so that's where HTML5 comes in. By the way, content can also be in XML. It takes all these technologies that once existed on their own plane and sort of integrated together and said, let's make this the de facto standard. 
because not all web pages had to support JS. In fact, as you see through the timeline that you'll go through this week, certain web browsers took longer to adopt those standards than others. IE is one of those. And so now we say if you are HTML5 compliant, you are going to support this core technology. And this core technology is what we believe that will make web apps popular. What does JavaScript allow us to do? JavaScript is what we call client-side programming. Example, have you ever tried to fill out an application online or a form and you missed a field and it won't let you hit submit until you verified that field? That's JavaScript. They said, let's not upload this to the server and have the server evaluate this. Let's have it evaluated on the client side before they submit. I mean, it's really easy to test if a box is empty, like if you forget to put your last name or your email or your phone number. Okay? But JavaScript has evolved and is becoming very, very complex to the level of Visual Basic or C++ or any object-oriented programming. JavaScript has now made it possible for us to run Microsoft Office via a web browser. And once again, we get back to this technology here. If we can run Office via a web browser, then it should work on any platform. Correct? So we get into the internet, we're going to explore this cloud technology. The key here is though, these resources, these technologies, are stored on servers. What is the definition of a server? They like to say a centrally located device that many users can have access to it. I don't like using the word centrally located because they're not put in the middle of the country, let alone in the middle of the world. I'd rather just say it is a place that many users can go to to share resources. Okay? You can think of servers as like, I don't know, the building, the mall, where many different services are offered. Like when you go to the mall, you guys can go to the food court, you can go buy clothes, buy video games, buy perfume. All of which back in the day would have been done by individual source, right? So when we look at servers, the question is, how do you, the user, access these services. On the cloud. And by the way, the list can go on and on. Email, instant messaging, um, web, uh, what else? Uh, online video games, online entertainment. So we just generify them services. Even web apps is considered a service. What do you guys type in here? Name of the website. No longer will we call it the name of the website. Call it the URL, which is short for Uniform Resource Locator. Now, you guys will say type in the name of the website. You might type in something like this. Today, that's kosher. Back in the day, that wasn't kosher. In fact, your web browser will automatically fill in this. Whoops. No, no, it's colon forward forward slash. Right? When you guys open up a web browser, you type in any domain name, it's going to throw in the HTTP colon forward forward slash. It'll even also probably add, which I forgot to do, my apologies, the www, followed by a dot, followed by the domain name, and then followed by the slash. Hmm. There are four to five parts of a URL. What is this part called? Expect this to be changed. Do not get lazy and always think that, because I believe your web browser won't be called a web browser in the future anymore. 
I believe your web browser has the power of replacing your operating system. I know Google's trying this. Google has a web browser called Chrome, right? They also have a operating system loosely used called Chroma or simply Chrome OS. And now they're trying to sell a laptop called Chromebook. They're hung up on this word called Chrome. Now, this laptop is like $200. In order for it to work, you have to have an internet connection. Turn it on. First thing it loads in is your web browser. And that's it. If you want to open up word processing, you will open up Google Docs. If you want to open up a spreadsheet program, you will open up Google Spreadsheets. If you want to edit photos, you will open up Picasa. Think about it. It only makes sense. How many of you are using your computers more to browse the web than for anything else? Does that laptop need to be all that powerful? No, because all the processing can be done here on the servers, on the cloud. The only drawback is the connection speed between the web browser and the service. So like I said, get away from the generic HTTP. Because mostly right now, the only thing that's been driving on a website, or sorry, through the web, is the HTTP protocol. The first part of a URL is called the protocol part. Modern web browsers are able to handle more sophisticated protocols. This protocol, whoops, there's supposed to be two slashes there, is ultimately going to tell those pieces of technology how to behave. Number two, exactly called the service or server name. WWW represents web service. You guys can try this. You can go to Yahoo by typing in www.yahoo.com and it should take you to the search engine. However, if we replace the W's with mail.yahoo.com, where do you think that's going to take you to? To your webmail, correct? So just to give you an idea that this part right here represents services. This part is made up of two parts. Together we call it the domain name. This little guy right here is called the TLD, the top level domain. Can anybody get a domain name? Anybody watch the Super Bowl this past uh, season? Of course you can. You just have to go to what website? GoDaddy, right? What are they called? Domain name providers? What they work with is this whole internet registry, if you will. You go to a domain name company, you type in a name that you would like, maybe your last name, and then you'll put it with a, T a TLD afterwards like .com, .biz, .net, .org, .edu, .gov, the list goes on, right? And they just expanded it. They finally approved .xxx, which, thank God, because that makes administration a lot easier. Because now you can put all the, and by the way, the adult industry is really pissed off about this. Because you can start filtering sites that have .xxx, so a student can't, Example would be like White House, and please do not do this. Uh, you will get something that you're not expecting. If you want to go see the White House, you know, the place where the president lives, it's not whitehouse.com. What do you think it should be? .gov, right? And so as administrator, that was such a pain in the ass because there were certain terminologies, let's say, that could overlap like a sporting goods company. And you could put .com, and it's going to take you to some ranch, if you will. 
and uh, not that I've been there. <laughs> I've been told, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, there's this whole, I guess you can say, mixing business with pleasure issue. And it was hard to filter these out. So they finally passed this concept of extending the TLDs because it started off with just a very select few. Dot coms, which represent commerce or communication. And there's always uh, converse, you know, there's always big controversy because nobody really knows what the dot com stands for. We originally want to say commerce because the idea was business wanted to use the internet to make money off of it. It wasn't very safe and so it wasn't taken off. But then how do you explain like search engines and uh, other sites that aren't really making money, like Facebook per se, by user transactions, if you will? So we say combination, sorry, it's a combination of commerce slash communications, okay? So .com meant that. What about .gov? Could you guys get a .gov site? No. Now you can get a .com site. You're allowed that. So gov was let for government. What about EDUs? Could you guys get an EDU site? No, they're actually restricted. Believe it or not, they're only restricted to universities and high-level institutions. They are changing that policy to make it available for K through 12 as well. Up to that point, it was only uh, institutions and uh, universities. What about .org? Could you guys get a .org site? What does org represent? Organization. And could you get a .org site? Yes. 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 What's that? Yeah, and, and what's the definition of an organization? Group, right? And if it's nonprofit, you're not making any money. So what if you had a club? Could you go out and get a .org? Yeah. They are trying to make that tougher. Because, folks, what am I trying to illustrate here? Some security concerns. Because when you go browsing over the web and just randomly type in some addresses, there's some things you should expect. If you type in something that ends with a .xxx, it's not an extra large t-shirt. Okay? So there should be something you should be expecting when you go to that site. So if you type in nick.xxx, by the way, I don't have that, so, but you could use your imagination, it might scare you, but nevertheless, there's an expectation. What about dot .mil or military? You get any idea? What about, uh, and I do this all the time for my students, and I got to give this company credit. Kudos for the marketing team on this one. Uh, do you guys have to do this every year to ask for financial assistance? Uh, is it FASA? Yeah. You guys go on their website because I believe they got rid of the paper application now. Now, if you didn't know better but you knew the magical letters, you might say FASA.com, correct? And guess what? They make their site look almost nearly identical to the other one that's probably the one you should be going to, right? which is dot gov, correct? Now, Wendy's shaking her head. Did you experience this? Yeah, and you're filling out all this work. I mean, you spent three hours busting your ass off, and then at the end of it, they'll ask you for a credit card number, and then they'll say, we will fill this out for you for the actual real site. Well, do you realize you just did all that work for them, and all they're going to do is submit it to them, because it's the same database, if you will, and they're going to share that information. Kudos for them. Now you guys know better, right? So pay attention to this TLD. Yes, anybody can get a domain name. Um, you do have to pay for it. You are registering it. Usually it's a yearly subscription. All right? Why do you have to pay for it? Why can't you just own it up? Well, sometimes these names uh, go out there and they're not being used just like LAN, and it's like, okay, well, if you're not using it, it should go back to the pool, correct? Well, we're realizing that this is becoming quite popular, and people are making sort of a business adventure off of it, because they'd go out there and buy all these types of combinations and own them up. And trust me, in the 90s, this is the way you were making your money. You'd go out there and buy all those 1-900 phrases, we'll just call it that way, own up to them, because they're a phrase. They can't be trademarked. But if you're using that as your business's, I don't know, what do they call that, brand, if you will, then wouldn't it make sense to buy that phrase so that when we didn't have search engines like we do today, people would just open up a web browser and it's like, oh, you try this site out. 
and it comes up. Isn't that the whole idea of branding? So when you guys hear a, tone, uh, hear a musical uh, melody, you associate it with something? All right, so what they're doing now is they're sort of getting carried away now with these uh, TLDs and they're starting to make them blend it like it might be google.le now. In fact, YouTube can go to be utu.be and not youtube.com. So it's pretty neat. We're getting away from this whole structure to something that's more, oh, I don't know, flexible and accommodating. And the reason why it becomes important is because, folks, URLs are used to find any resource on the Internet. As more and more people are using the Internet, what do you think is going to happen to the number of resources that become available? It's going to grow. I mean, I think the Internet's up to like 6 billion users. It's either somewhere between 3 and 6, all right? It's a lot of people. And they're all contributing it in some form or another. And if you want to find their resources, these URLs are going to need to grow. All right, after this slash might be a folder. And then after that might be a name. 